Yes, methods and solutions. So manipulation is uh, a challenge that I guess has been covered a little bit earlier, especially with um, Tetsu's talk about the earthquake recovery in Japan. Uh, but if you've ever seen some of seen the um, the solutions that have actually been deployed, they're actually fairly cumbersome. So, I mean, as an example, for instance, um, the equations for inverse kinematics have been known for decades, and yet the robots that you see going into um, you know, actually diffuse bombs to you know, counter IEDs in Afghanistan and Iraq are still joint controlled. And as um, I think Martin um, mentioned yesterday, you know, you're, the operator's faced with a board full of switches and they've got to try and, you know, it's, it's like trying to play a piano while, as you're, when you're trying to do something. So what I'll talk a little bit about are the uh, test methods where we've broken down the uh, tasks that these responders have into their elemental components so that we can show the performance difference between different implementations. And this is where you guys come in, where we can show the difference in performance between what is currently deployed and what is actually possible with the latest and greatest technologies. The idea is, is that if we can get everyone talking this language, we can say that you know, the robot in Iraq has performed these tasks in these test methods with this level of performance, but there's a laboratory in New Zealand or Korea or Turkey or wherever that has demonstrated performance on exactly the same task and that is directly comparable to this level of performance. Hey, you should be getting those people to collaborate with someone who can bring that to market. So this is why we want to let you guys all know about these test methods so we can get this common um, language. So what we do is we, at NIST, are focused on measurement science. We try and, you know, when you have a task such as inspecting a bag or inspecting a wall, it's very hard to get any actual measurement science out of it because there are so many variables. So what we do is we break down these tasks. In this case, we've chosen two dimensions. There are many more. But we've broken them down into elemental tasks that are performed in elemental apparatuses. And then the test methods form the junctions between each of these, um, each of these dimensions. And as you can see at NIST, we've been working on several, we're validating, we're actually gathering test data from deployed robots in several of these tasks. There are several more which we are prototyping. There are several which we're leaving for additional work. And what you'll notice is, because we try and keep these relevant to the responders, we also have dimensions which are less standardized. So for instance, we have operational tools which are very hard to standardize because they're very, very specific. And I'll go into a couple of those later, but we still perform them in the, um, in the elemental apparatuses in order to maintain the link between the two. So here are a couple of examples. So a very, very simple, very obvious one but one that's actually do, seems to not be very well standardized is simply the act of lifting a package. So, I mean, this is basically the kind of test you'll find in an industrial robot where you can get the graph saying in these regions you have this kind of lifting capacity. You'd be shocked how many of deployed robots <coughs> don't actually have this graph. So you don't actually know if you're rolling up to a package that's a particular weight or is estimated to be a particular weight which way do you need to point your robot? And you find all kinds of really, really interesting patterns. So for instance, you find that there's these robots that look fairly symmetrical, but in fact they can't lift anything on one side for various reasons. You know, or you find that a robot can only lift in front of itself or behind itself. These are things that responders need to know. These are things that are also you know, important to know when, you, when they're trying to procure a robot. You know, I would bet that anyone who's bought this robot doesn't actually know this when they bought the robot. You've uh, seen the, the pipe star in um, Adam's talk, so this is going into something a little bit more abstract than just lifting weights. How well can you inspect a package? You look at a robot, yeah, they should be able to inspect a package. What does it actually mean to, in be, to inspect a package? You need to be able to see all sides of it to a particular level of visual acuity. But you also need to be able to see inside it if you have if you manage to open a, put an opening in or it's partially open. So we have 
these apparatuses, which are a test of directed inspection. So can you actually direct the at a particular point? Which means that you need a certain number of degrees of freedom, because not only do you need to be able to reach somewhere, but then you need to be able to point your sensor back to see something. It's a degree of freedom that the vast majority of deployed robots don't actually have. <coughs> and you need to be able to do it all around the robot. The robot sits in the middle of this spider web and isn't allowed to move. So let's say you've rolled up on something and you can't move because you're on a stairwell. If you turn, you're going to fall off, or you simply don't have the room. Let's say you know, you're in an industrial complex. Where are you able to inspect a package, or a circuit board, or a switch, or you know, the, um, the, the, cooling, um, the cooling control panel in a nuclear reactor? So each of these um, pipe stars has an eye chart so we can tell. Can you do this with your best camera? <coughs> Interestingly, of course, we also do, you'll notice in the previous slides, another one from directed perception was manipulation. Can you take an object, put it in, take it out? Can you remove something from a bag without disturbing all the other contents? Can you lift a bottle off a shelf without knocking the shelf over? In this case, can you take this object out of the pipe star, which is it's a tight fit. In fact, if you pull it too hard, the air pressure will cause the thing to fall over. Can you extract it smoothly? Very, very hard to do with the robots that are currently deployed, with a couple of notable exceptions. But this is the kind of thing that can be done if there's a little bit of intelligence in the system quite easily. Some other things. Radial. You'd be, when you're trying to roll into a room, you probably want to see what's going on around the room if you're looking for a suspicious package. We need to figure out where the blind spots are in these robots. And you get some really strange things happening. For instance, you get robots which have absolutely beautiful PTZ cameras, but they're on a mast that only goes to here, between here and here. So that means that the only thing that they can use to see what's on the floor is their driving camera, which has a field of view like this, but has absolutely no resolution. Okay. So when you're building a robot to inspect a room, you better make sure that not only can you see the floor, but you can see the floor if there's a table there, so you can come down here with your sensors. <coughs> Cylindrical. So um, one um, something that um, Martin also mentioned a bit of in the uh, the SWAT team and bomb um, bomb disposal um, areas is um, what happens if you've got a bomb vest on a person. Can you actually inspect a package around a person? Maybe you can't get to the other side. Can you cut straps that may be holding a backpack on so you can remove the, um, the bomb? Can you inspect around a pillar or another object, especially if you can't get to the other side of it? Again, you'd be surprised how many robots can't do this. You will see these test methods, by the way, starting to come into the RoboCop rescue competition. In fact, just this year we already started having the cylindrical test methods um, in there. This is all about making sure that the Robocop rescue competition stays relevant to the uh, tasks that uh, people need to perform when you deploy these robots. So some more cylindrical. Planar. Can you roll up to a truck <coughs> You can't get to the window. Can you reach over and look in the window? Say there's a fire hydrant in the way, there's another car. Can you reach over there, get normal again, and break out the window? Or drill a hole in the side of the truck so you can insert a camera? Okay. Um, of course, you need to bring certain capabilities. You need to bring a shoulder joint. Again, you'd be surprised how many of these robots don't have these shoulder joints. This, is, of course, is one that does, and this actually this one actually, this robot, the Telemax, and I think you'll recognize it from the coins that Martin handed out, um, actually does a very, very good job at these tests because they were developed by a company that actually values these, um, these um, uh, developments coming through. Um, something going to something more operational. Can you clear a vehicle cap? And we might actually see something like this um, later on in this event where we try to start growing robots through some of these more operational things. You know, can you inspect the, um, the dashboard, the seat, 
you know, maybe a, a person. Can you lift things out of the back of a vehicle? When you're developing a robot, you might have a brilliant lifting capacity, but what happens if you need to do it up here in a confined space and you need to lift it over other objects? So things from the, um, from the application that are, um, that are relevant and yet can thwart a lot of robots. We, of course, also then moved into the more operational apparatuses. You know, we actually have um, tests, elemental tests, that we embed into operational scenarios, such as into the back of cars. You can actually get um, you know, tools that will punch through the side of a car, so can you then inspect what's inside? Can you do something with uh, you know, a person who's, um, who's not responding? Can you in inspect them, move them around? Um, a bit more directed perception. Then can you reach around and look back in? Do you have extension tools which allow you to look into holes in unusual places, in the wheel wells, things like that? If you're building an inspection robot and you're marketing it as an inspection robot, you know, some, you, you, one good thing to know is can you, for instance, look between the wheels of a semi-trailer? Things like that. The test methods themselves, um, we always try and make sure that everyone can at least get on the board. So we start simple. But then we, we also want to make sure that we can separate out the best in performance. So for instance, a directed perception task, can you see an object? So the easiest one, which isn't shown here, can you see something that's flat against the wall? Say you've got a hazardous materials label, can you read it? One, you know, every robot should be able to do that or at least see there's something there. Everyone can get on the board, just like in Robocop. Next level harder, can you see inside this, this pipe? Just like the uh, directed inspection pipe we showed you earlier, there's an eye chart in there. Fairly large, 10 centimetres, so even if you're not quite aligned, if you don't have the precision, say your user interface isn't quite good enough, and every time you try and move, you do this, you know, you can't get the level of precision, you need to look down at, you can at least get on the board with some truly direct perception here. Then we make it harder, we put an insert in there, 5 centimetre hole, 15 centimetres deep. Now, can you see everything at the back of that hole? At this point, you need good user interfaces, and you need good levels of control, you need good inverse kinematics in order to give you very precise movement to see what's going on. Some more manipulation, actual, actually manipulating the world. Of course, you need to cut holes in, um, in things like the, the vans, so you can put a camera inside to see if there's something in there. You may need to break a window, and you'd be surprised how hard it is to break a window with a robot. Especially if you're between two cars, so you can't move very much, the window's at a slope, and it, you know, you're trying to poke at it, and you just keep glancing off the surface. So there's actually some work going on with um, devices that actually use uh, projectiles that can um, shoot them out. Can you apply a perpendicular force, a more abstract uh, measure, but that's useful for tool deployment, because you need to apply force normal to a surface. Strap cutting I mentioned. Operational tools, the, um, the um, debit modules that Martin mentioned, um, talked about um, yesterday. You know, can you actually deploy these? This is a stick, a long stick, that's supposed to sit between the two windows of a vehicle with explosive charges in it. The idea is that it's supposed to rip open the, um, the interior of the cab to expose any explosive that might be inside without setting them off. This stick is heavy, it's long, and robots that currently carry it you know, it's wobbling around like this as you're trying to traverse over rough terrain, and then you're trying to aim it through these two windows, which you may have just broken out so they're not clean. It's very, very hard. A bit of intelligence. When you pick up an object, do you, do you have the control intelligence to say, oh, this object has these kinds of capabilities. I need to adjust my controller so I can keep the thing stable. You know, open research problems which are not quite obvious until you look at these operational tasks. And of course, there's all manner of tools that are needed. Automatic leveling. Automatic leveling, automatic stability as you're trying to traverse over terrain. These things exist. Why don't they exist in things that can um, help save lives? Other tasks. So you've probably seen this uh, bunch of wood sitting over here that Adam's uh, put up. You know, this is something that um, our respond um, advisory panel has told us is actually quite important. If you have a pillar, right, that's come, that's, you know, say you have an earthquake. You have a pillar holding up the ceiling that's unstable. You need to be able to shore it before you can have any confidence that the ceiling isn't going to fall on you. So you need to build these cradles. Can a robot do that? 
small block, easy. Imagine that this thing is three meters long. You need two hands to manipulate it. Okay, a challenge that will probably show up in Robocop really, really soon. So, here are some of the really, really quick overview of some of the challenges. What are some of the solutions that have come about? So, one of them, of course, as Martin mentioned, is make sure you have all the tools with you. So there are various really cool things happening with tool changes, especially in our smart tool changes, not just grabbing something in the gripper, changing out your whole gripper on the robot. We, of course, have the two-handed manipulation solutions that Tetsu um, talked about um, earlier. Of course, this dates back to, when was this again? This, how long ago was, um, was the dragon? How long ago was this robot? This was been about 90 something, right? Reach. No, how, how, um, how many years ago was this? Uh, 2007. 2007, Five okay. So, there have been people working on these tasks as well. We've, um, you know, more recent ones, you know, SRI. You, ev everyone here knows the Da Vinci robot, okay? They're working on a Da Vinci star robot that can sit on the end of a manipulator. Yes, that's me. Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> quite. Um, but, you know, some intelligence in here because there's a stereo head here and there's some very fine manipulation. Can you actually pull the SIM card out of a phone that's part of a detonation circuit, for instance? So that was straight stereo, straight to your goggles. Right? Straight stereo, straight to the goggles. But there is some, uh, a little bit of um, funniness going on here because um, there's some scaled uh, motions here. So these are all inverse, running off inverse kinematics um, just based on the 3D positions of the, manipulate, of the uh, controller here. This works well. Um, there are simpler solutions which maybe don't work quite so well but um, are much easier to implement. So for instance, this is um, the, uh, the lobster. Um, using a master-slave system. So stereo camera here again, um, but actually you've got a slave arm here that you move around. So some challenges there, of course, is how can you keep that relevant because you can't often have exactly the same joint positions. But you can still do cool things like open bags, tie shoelaces and the like. Um, more hardened solutions. So you saw the, um, the one with me grinning at you moving the controller around. This fairly delicate. Some of these controllers are actually making it to somewhat deployable um, state. So this is a controller by Harris, much the same. What it doesn't look like here, but you can actually do, is you can actually grab the entire thing by the controller, swing it around, and it's not going to break. Can you make your controllers hardened enough to be deployable? Um, and of course, some other arms that can also kick these objects out. Some cool stuff that's um, actually, um, unfortunately, Hal Halden couldn't be here to present um, some of the early, some of the work that he did. Um, but there's some even cooler stuff coming out with these um, hyper redundant arms. We're talking, you know, 12 degrees of freedom on three different arms each, where you have um, two arms to manipulate something and then a, a camera on the head. One of the big problems when you're trying to manipulate something is, do you actually are you actually able to see what you're doing? So in this system the arms move in a, in a way that's sensible relative to where the camera position is and the camera position moves in a way that's sensible to where the arms are and it all does this automatically so he, um, one story he says is you know, he, had, um, he had grandmothers um, you know, opening bags and things using this thing after a very short um, period of time and uh, let's see if um, I mean let's see if I can play one of his one of the videos from the um, that he has where he has a, a robot you know, this is, and bear in mind that this is still an experimental robot, which is why it's a bunch of servos. Um, some of you may have even seen the YouTube of this robot shaving some guy's head. Um, so so they're, they're just Dynamixels? Yeah, these are just Dynamixels, the same Dynamixels we have here. But imagine that these were now Amtec power cubes, or you know, some of the other you know, power balls that we have around here. You can get these nice arms that you can then actually control in a fairly intuitive way. Notice that there's several things moving here, but the only thing it's doing is, is, is telling the end effect is where to go, and it's software. It's, you know, the next generation of inverse kinematics doing the rest of it. And this is, I mean, this is not the only thing out there that does this. There are other technologies out there that um, extend inverse kinematics to make sure that, you know, manipulators move in ways that are intuitive for the operator. One of the major problems that we have is that operators don't want to use something new because they've spent so long learning a bad interface that they can't stomach learning something else, even if it might be better. Do you have a picture of the interface? 
No, I don't, unfortunately. Um, Hal does it. I don't know how they're interfacing with that. Well, you, I guess you've, you've, you've seen it. Well, there's two space balls, one hand each. They're only controlling the outer two arms with the space balls, with joint lockouts or access lockouts and appropriate things, but in 3D space. And that third arm is actually just the system trying to make sure that the camera at the end of it stays focused on the end effectors. So you always have a good view of your hands. So that third arm is just basically always moving around to make sure that the tool tips are in the field of view. So one guy controlling all that, really good. And show some more of these videos later, later on. Um, but yeah, so lots of, I guess, things coming up that can be um, useful, but we want to see these technologies move further and actually get deployed so that we can tell the responders these things are coming, these technologies are coming. And in fact, this one's actually been, um, been sold to a, uh, um, a company that's, that's going to hopefully take it a little bit further. Um, but this by no means solves all the challenges that we've decomposed and in the challenges that we've even yet to decompose or identify. So manipulation is a very, um, a very fertile ground for more intelligence as well as better mechanisms to come in. So here it's shown as a manipulator on the robot, but that is clearly just an afterthought, just to give it some mobility on its own. Mm. A very real application domain is that is the end effector. That's the new wacky triple arm end effector on a big robot that is conventionally built and exists. So the big arm gets that downrange, puts it, breaks the window, puts it inside the window, but just inside the window, and then it does everything for you. When you dexterity is new. One, one thing to think about, by the way, when you're designing these things is if you remember the Lobster or the SRI robots are a fairly large thing. If you're trying to break out a small hole in the side of a truck, very hard to get through. Look at this. It ends up, you can have, fold up like a squid. Put through, expand out. Useful things to keep in mind when you're designing your robots. But um, anyway, let's... Wait, wait, wait. Oh, you're going to... Okay. So obviously what this is bringing to the party is this hyper-redundancy that is, uh, you know, a whole area of research that we should be going towards quickly. Um, how, how many years until this gets on big robots, big bomb squad robots? Um, well, the sad, the, 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 I guess, hopefully not too much longer, but I mean, that's kind of subject to... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It's kind of funny, when, when you look at these type of things, and like Raymond mentioned earlier, he was talking about the automatic leveling or these, so, so it's available. In my opinion, here's what's happened over the years with <coughs> robotics, say for bomb squads. You have these robot companies, and you run into these guys, say, at a big conference. You say, hey, how come you guys don't do this? I just went to something else and I see if you can do this. And they go, ooh, we could probably do it, but that's really going to make the cost go up. And so you kind of start scaring people because they think, well, I can barely afford this robot now if the cost goes up. Same thing with a bomb suit. We have a new standard for a bomb suit. We never used to have standards before. There's people that I've talked to that said, I don't care what the standard does, even if it makes it more safe, if it makes the cost go up, I don't want the standard on it. You know, so I think these people really do kind of scare people into thinking that if you do anything unique, if you put this on a bigger robot, I think the cost is going to go up, way up, and you can't afford it, and so people are just, they're kind of happy with the status quo. Or, true, all that. Or they don't understand what what we're talking about can bring them in terms of capabilities. They don't fully understand that you can grab a soft object and unzip a soft zipper and spread it over. The robot companies or the bomb techs? The bomb techs who are being told, well, when the robot companies tell you it's going to be too expensive, half of that is only, it's, it's a very small part of the story. 
I suspect that most of them are capable of actually doing this. And that may be so. The wrong people who are building robots for deployment, they're not roboticists, clearly. No one in this room would deploy half of what has been deployed and try to call it a robot. Um, it was the cheapest way to build something, it was mildly effective, and it was remote. And maybe it was an okay first pass. But there's so much more that can be done, and the only question about the cost comes into, you know, can we do it at scale? Not that they're building any of these things at scale, but, you know, there is some honest cost. But what my argument to that argument is, to responders, is are they considering the life cycle cost of their robot, including training? As soon as they add keeping five guys proficient on a robot with a bad interface and no inverse kinematics, they're going to spend hours and months trying to learn that bad robot interface. And that trumps the cost, the initial cost of the robot. I can tell you that is not figured. It's not figured. They don't even think about it. What they think is what Raymond said. Oh my god, I barely can do anything with the existing interface I have. There's no way I can ramp up on a second one that is equally bad. So we have to sort of break that paradigm by getting them onto robots so they can see what locking out axes allow you to do remotely, teleoperatively. I mean, to support that, uh, like I was talking about the uh, LSAR system where you have acoustic and seismic sensors, the operator on top listening to the sounds. Uh, like getting yourself accustomed to that takes a long time. Which is something very simple as listening to a voice or a sound that's coming from the rubble. So if there is a, like a bad interface you try to get used to that, that'll take months and months of just doing that. So we have to communicate better. Video is powerful. Hands-on operation is ten times as powerful. Um, that's actually what our training suite is really meant to get at for the bomb squad community. So that we figure that if we have 10 or 15 tests that are easy to do, <coughs> that get you to interact with the robot, we're more likely to get those people off of their existing robot and try to spend the one day, eight hours that it takes to at least try the training set of the new robot. Here's a new way to think about it, a new way to do it. Invest one day, see how far you get. With robotics, helping them do the tasks. The learning curve is steep and long on a joint control remote manipulator. To the point that it's impossible to do most of what they want to do. Their frustration is not unfounded. But anyway, so I just want to close with some thoughts. So manipulation is a big challenge and it's a challenge that has been very poorly addressed compared to things like, you know, even just rock terrain mobility. Um, you know, breaking down the elemental tasks allows us to uh, <coughs> communicate these challenges. It makes us, allows us to compare performance, allows us to ensure that we're working on the right problems and that everything stays relevant. Mechanical capabilities are coming up to deployment and we are starting to see some of these hyper-redundant systems coming out. Um, and intelligence and performance is the next challenge. And I'd add in there also user interfaces are the next challenge. And then, of course, there's a challenge of actually getting these things to, uh, to market to the people who actually need them. So that's um, it from me. Um, I'm going to take a couple of quick questions um, while Kestu maybe sets up for um, his presentation. Okay, so any quick questions? I okay. I want to ask what is NIST doing? Uh, uh, is it setting any standards regarding uh, regarding rescue robotics? Right, so the matrix that you saw there are all the standards that we are working on for rescue and response robotics in this field. So where we have, where we saw the green squares, they're ones that we're validating. When you make a test, you need to run robots through there, generate some test data and make sure that you get statistically significant performance, that you can separate out performance so you don't saturate the test at either end, and that robots that perform differently on the test actually perform differently in ways that are relevant in the actual application. Um, Adam showed you the, the I guess, the, the chart with the test methods coming down here, but we loop through the responders and through the researchers. So all the green ones are going through that process and a, part, a, a, a fair way through. So yes, that's, that's exactly what we're doing.
and that's a big, and that's also incidentally one reason why we're going through with the um, Robocup Rescue Competition is it allows us to also run through the researchers in this process. And what are uh, our opportunities for getting involved with NIST uh, and contributing to these standards? I'll, I'll, I'll let Adam answer that one, I guess. Sorry, what's that? How can we get involved with, uh, and contribute to the activities that NIST is uh, carrying out regarding setting standards? Development of standards? Yeah. Development of standards specifically, you already are in your practical. That's what you're doing. So he's in the robot design practical, and the responders and us as a group have come up with a few new test methods uh, based on things we saw here, uh, ideas that they had. He's modeled the first three of them or so in Pro E so that we can actually start disseminating these things to the other competitions and to the other test facilities. That's the process. The process is you get a requirement from a responder. In this case, let's just say the requirement was not clean stairs, included stairs, because that's what stopped the robot from shooting. And then we adapted that crossing stick concept onto the stairs, and you have a model of it, and we can all talk about it, and they are here to validate it and say, yep, but it needs to be harder than that. And then they'll go away, and they'll put five more sticks in there, and then they'll say, that looks good. Make that the test. That's the process. So we do it here at this camp, but we also do it for our day job. So throughout the year, so if you want to be involved, even remotely, there's totally a way to be involved. There are standards of meetings twice a year you're welcome to come to or just kind of uh, keep track of. It's an open process. Yeah, I'd love to get involved with it. Okay. Yeah, this is a constant, 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 constant.